and sunlight. Um, also, there's ideas about kind of temperature, so it had to be not too hot and not too cold. So the Lamer Joint Sanitarium was located above Sacramento um, and kind of at foothills, but it was also not high enough to be really cold in the mountains. So it was supposed to be above the fog line and below the snow line. Um, and I just put one of the example of one of the dorm buildings up there. Um, so buildings like this that have a lot of windows, very typical on the site. And this is one of the later ones. Um, some of, uh, originally most of the buildings, the dorms of the site had screens on them. Um, so they would have been open to the air and kind of putting in window glass came in later. Joint Sanitarium. It opened in 1919. Um, it was an effort by multiple counties. There were at least 11 that were that started out banding together to decide to make a tuberculosis sanatorium, um, and up to 15 at one point. Um, most of the people, though, I think at the sanatorium, at least the different periods, were coming from kind of the Sacramento area. Um, so. Uh, but they're also coming from other parts of North and Central California. Um, it was publicly operated and it was supposed to be for indigent patients. Um, there were a number of different sanatoriums um, located in the neighboring town of Colfax. Um, and those were privately operated. So, um, and some of them you have to there are different different levels in which they they cost is they cost different different amounts of money um, depending on the sanatory. So this one was supposed to be for people who couldn't pay for treatment um, at the other sanatoriums. Um, so it eventually changed names to the Weimar Medical Center um, and started. Divert, uh, started being more of a general treatment center. Um, and after it closed in 1972, um, in the mid-1970s, it became a relocation center for uh, called Hope Village um, for Vietnamese refugees during the Vietnam War. Um, and then in 1977, it was um, bought by a group of Seventh-day Adventists and who are using the site right now and um, are still there. Okay, so some of the ways that um, disease, although people often study disease in archaeology through looking at um, human remains or medicine bottles. Um, there's a lot of other ways that you can think about disease in the body through material culture. Um, some examples of this is um, are, are just hygiene practices. Um, so spittoons became a popular certain point where, where there were public health advertisements to um, limit spitting. Um, another example <coughs> that I put up here is that people don't often think about is skirt length. Um, so there is a fear that people would that people would spit on the ground, and then women would drag their skirts through the spit, and then and through the dust, and then bring that into the home. Um, so even small things about material culture have these like spatial and material um, implications. And although you kind of interact with the material culture on a daily basis, <laughs> and spitting is probably a lot less common, um, you don't necessarily think about this as being connected to TB or to some of these other diseases that aren't, aren't less common these days. So this is also true of kind of landscapes and the built environment. Um, 
So I talked a little bit about windows earlier, um, but there's certain other aspects um, of the built environment that became a little bit more popular in vernacular architecture. So porches um, for sleeping outside and solariums um, and kind of ideas of the outdoor space um, and bringing sunlight into the home. Um, and I just wanted to show, so that this is one of the sanatoriums that was in Colfax. Um, it is a good example of what these sanatoriums look like. They're, they're usually, they look a lot like what you think of as camps nowadays. Um, some of the other ones look more like institutional buildings or what you think about as hospitals. Um, but there's kind of a diversity of sanatoriums um, and a diversity of building types. Um, but a lot of these focused strongly on like kind of being outdoors. Um, this movement also coincided with around the time that uh, governments were increasingly setting light aside land for parks um, and for a, just kind of generally like a wilderness and fresh air movement. Um, and a lot of the ideas about space um, and landscape um, and going on vacation camping um, and things that people continue to do in these areas and you continue to use the landscape in California um, can be related back to some of these ideas about health um, and the environment. Um, so in addition to some of that, the sanatorium spaces themselves were designed specifically around certain foods and certain build uh, certain, uh, certain practices. Um, most blueprints are not this detailed, um, but the blueprints for like, like this is an example of the dining hall um, for the sanatorium shows um, specific locations where like bread should be served, um, and there's it shows the segmentation of space. So this is women or female patients were supposed to come in one side and then get served food in the middle and then go to a dining room on this side. Um, and male patients were supposed to come in the other side and go through. Um, so there were specific ideas about how, um, what particular practices, uh, particular food practices that were actually kind of written into um, the building and were planned for. So there's a number of different 
explanations for why some of the, this, these disparities um, and the way this space is allocated could have, could have happened. Um, but there, there's definitely some divisions in ways that you can, that can look at the way that the space was allocated. Okay, so some other things that also um, I'm looking at as part of the research are narratives um, about identification um, and how these um, contribute to ideas about health. Um, so TB in the late 19th century was called consumption, um, and then it transitioned to be called tuberculosis after germ theory. Um, and there are kind of ideas about it's a long-term illness, um, and there was kind of an expression at that time, um, one author describes that it, so it, it was connected to um, kind of behavioral and um, gendered stories at that time too. So an example of this is, um, this is like the, an 1821 silent film about um, a woman named Camille who is kind of a, described as a courtesan, a French courtesan, and then she um, dies of tuberculosis, but the movie kind of connects it to, she compares her to her friend who is like working, who, who so there's a very strong like moral overtones, um, and this like idea of like a tragic female character, um, heroine often of doing, um, connected to prostitution, um, is often tied to ideas about tuberculosis at that time. Um, and some of the narratives continue to be, to exist. Um, so this is also very similar to the plot of Moulin Rouge. Um, so even though you don't necessarily think about these narratives as, as, being, as con continuing to be popular, um, they still have, they're, they're still there. Okay, so another thing too I'll be talking about a lot that's sh kind of shaping my approach are archaeologies of institutions. Um, this is kind of the idea that the space um, and the buildings have an active role in shaping um, bodies and behavior um, or are intended to do so. Um, so an example of this is the prison, uh, um, kind of like classic examples of panopticon which is a prison designed so that prison guards could see patient or see that um, see inmates at all from all sides. So even though um, inmates didn't necessarily know whether they were being watched, the assumption that they could be watched at that time was intended to control behavior um, just through the layout of space. Um, and Archaeologies and institutions often focus on institutions of reform, such as prisons or workhouses. Um, there's also um, some authors have critiqued this use for like for medical institutions because healthcare is also an important thing to have access to. Um, so, which has been historically denied to um, and many people. Um, so there's kind of, one thing that I'm thinking about are kind of intersecting institutions and the way that this kind of um, intersects with poverty um, or other institutions as well. Um, so, also, so also this is connected to ideas of the self and kind of processes of identification um, through material culture. So part of this um, is the idea that institutions play a role in transforming the self through kind of replacing um, material culture, personal material culture with other, uh, with institutional types, which are all, all the same. Um, this is the case in a lot of, if you look at like ceramics, a lot of the case which tend to be um, at, at, this, at this place, but at other places as well, tends to be kind of, white, um, this is a heavy 
hotel where a hotel porcelain cup that was very durable. Um, so it could be looked at it in this way. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit on how my fieldwork um, practices sort of look into some of these themes um, and concepts of identification. So the fieldwork that I'm doing at the site, most of the buildings are still there. Um, and there, so a lot of the material, um, so that's one reason I'm focusing on kind of the landscape and the buildings is that there's a lot of information still at the site. Um, but I'm also, so I've designed my site and my fieldwork plan to do, kind of focus on low impact fieldwork methods um, on mapping, so I can look at the kind of the spatial arrangement of the site, although there are a lot of maps for the building, a lot of them are, are not particularly accurate. Um, a lot of them are, I think that one or two show build, uh, buildings that I don't think were ever built. Um, so it's not always easy to really tell what you're looking at. Um, so I've, I've been doing mapping and pedestrian survey. Um, I've also been doing a lot of geophysical survey, including um, magnetometer and ground penetrating radar, um, and combining this with oral histories and interviews. Okay, so for the mapping, I've mostly been using Tuttle Station for the site. Um, GPS was not particularly accurate because of, there's a lot of trees and buildings and obstacles. Um, so I'd be using in certain situations to really get good points to locate the total station map. Um, but for the most part, I've been using the total station, um, sometimes using a prism and sometimes on reflectorless mode um, to map areas of the site. Um, so I just put this up to give kind of a sense of what the site is like um, and what the survey conditions are. Um, so a lot of the site is has buildings and is landscaped over, um, but quite a lot of it, and I'll show this on my next slide, is also just has trees. Um, and some places there's like the ground is clear, but some places there's a whole lot of vegetation. Um, so the areas that I've been working looking at um, are going to be strongly affected by what what the area is like. And in some cases too, there's there's a hill, so there's um, places where the stuff has been eroding out of the hill or road cuts as well. Um, And this is not, you can't see it all that well, so I'll show you using the laser pointer. But this is kind of the area of the site. So there's um, a place with most of the buildings were in this area. Um, and then they have all of this here, which is more like trees. Um, and today they're hiking trails. Um, so I think it's useful just to give a sense of kind of how things are laid out. Um, and kind of the, it's actually a very large area too. Um, but some of the pedestrian survey has actually turned up some stuff, so I did find um, a can scatter. Um, this one is kind of in between, close, kind of close to the cemetery. The cemetery is not part of the project. Um, it's not part of the place that we've been surveying. Um, but this one's sort of outside of it. Um, and one of the bottles dated to um, 1942, which is around the time that the sanctuary would have been operating. Um, the cans are kind of a variety of sizes. Um, they're, and I think they're, so, so I'm not sure exactly what this means, I need to look into it more, but um, it might be a place where people were camping or um, use it, 
or, or just living um, kind of in some of this, these spaces on the periphery of where the sanatorium is. Um, and um, yeah, so some of the pedestrian survey can show sort of in addition to where the buildings are, but not everybody was living in the buildings. Um, there's also people who were apparently used as spaces outside of the like sanctioned architecture. Um, and places, there are also, I know from historic records too, a lot of the staff were living in like Colfax or neighboring areas too. Um, so this just shows that kind of, it's important to look beyond um, the actual institution itself and the design of the architecture, some of these other places. Okay, so I just put this up because it shows sort of some of the main color survey that we've been doing. Um, this is kind of the extent, um, and I'll show kind of closer pictures, but I think this just gives a sense of like kind of how much we've done at this point. Um, there's a lot of trees and a lot of buildings, um, roads and stuff like that, that kind of limit the areas that we could work. Um, but so a lot of where we chose to survey actually kind of reflects where there's like a big space where we could do a survey. Um, but there are some areas, and it, it, for the most part, even in places like this one, there's where there's a building right nearby, um, we still got good results. Um, so I think it's worth doing even if there's buildings nearby. Um, so this is an example of kind of one of the areas that we were surfing. Um, I chose this area because it's, it's kind of a big flat place, um, big flat lawn, um, and it, um, I just put it up here because it kind of shows an example of some of the stuff that we've been finding. Um, some of like this black and white design here is definitely a metal pipe um, that tend to give that pattern. Um, but there's also areas like this part's lighter. Um, I know from that was on the surface, so I know that that is a cement pathway. Um, but it's interesting that the that I was able to pick that up. Um, and then there's other, um, this is kind of, there's like a stone wall around a tree. Um, so it picks up stuff like that from the surface. But I could see, but also compared to other things that I'm not as sure what they are, um, that could be features. Um, they could also be just non-metallic pipes. There's also ceramic or plastic pipes on there that might show a different, um, that wouldn't show the black and white, but would show a different pattern. Um, but they also, um, but there's some other linear features um, and um, other kind of anomalies in there. So a lot of this too, we're looking, I was looking for landscaping features because that was a big part of how the sand frames were designed around this kind of idea of outdoor space. Um, so a lot of the, the survey area shows, um, so it's useful for us to kind of know, like, if something is, there, there are areas, we go back. So um, some places, some of this other stuff could be either like former flower beds, um, or other stuff that was intentional, intentionally designed as part of the sand <coughs> landscape. Okay, so we've also been combining this with GPR. Um, so one thing too that I've been looking for in some of this is I knew that a lot of the sand farms had tents. Um, so because they were interested in kind of the fresh air movement, um, having a, a lot of the sanatoriums put their patients in tents. Um, so those aren't necessarily going to be on historic maps. Um, so that's been one thing that I've been keeping an eye out for. Um, I think that they were, all the pictures I've seen, they're kind of platform tents. 
Um, and there's a few places where, um, it, so I think they would probably show post holes rather than a flat compacted area. Um, so that's one thing that I've been kind of looking for throughout all of this. Um, and I don't have all of my GPR yet, but this is kind of the areas that we covered. Okay, so they've also been um, in some places because it's an actively used um, site. They do dig for pipes um, and are doing various other things. Um, so whenever they were doing that, um, and I, I, they've been um, really nice about letting me come in and like record things. Um, so I've tried to draw kind of the stratigraphy whenever I can. Um, and take photos. Um, so this is an example of a place where they, they put in um, a drain and um, I ran the GPR down one side of it too, so I'll show that in the next slide, um, which is nice because then I could figure out actual depths for stuff that I was seeing. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot in this one as far as it, the only, I think the only really material like artifact thing was this um, railroad spike, and um, that could be, um, I think if people tend to reuse railroad ties and railroad spikes um, for landscaping things. It could be a tent, but I don't think they had that type. Um, but there's a number of things that they could use, um, so that, that could be something from that. Okay, so um, I need to put depths on this, um, but just as an example of some of the things that I was able to measure for that, um, that trench, um, this was a 900 megahertz antenna, um, which I've been mostly using instead of the 400. Um, because, well, I, I've been using both in different situations as much as I can. Um, but I think some of the stuff is more, it is, is within the first like, meter or so. Um, and this kind of shows that that's been working well. Um, so these, this is about the right depth um, according to, for what I measured actually fit with the, um, GP, what the GPR estimated the depth was. Um, but you could see this is like, these were two were pipes that I could see in profile. Um, and there was actually a little gravel pathway um, that I could see on a like I could see a profile, and then I could see where it continued on. So I'm pretty sure that that's what it was. Um, so it's nice to know that it's kind of been picking up stuff like that. Um, so I've also been kind of combining wherever I can, the two types. This isn't always possible because of the topography. There's a lot of landscaping plants, um, and when the ground is really rough, sometimes I can step over it with the magnetometer, but I can't always drag the GPR over it. Um, so I haven't been able to do this in all places. Um, but when I can, it's really it's useful. Um, and so this compares to uh, what the two readings look like. Um, this was next to um, the, kind of the children's building was over on this side um, and up here is which where the nurse's building was. Um, I know at some point there was like a playground area here um, so there could be features from that. Um, there were also some utilities nearby um, so I think a lot of this is probably pipes from that. Um, one of the things for this is that it's on a slope so um, I'm working through um, processing, the, processing this in such a way where, well, I can see it on the profiles, but processing it in such a way where it can take slices um, and show that better where the GPR is measuring on a steep slope. Okay, so this is just some other examples um, of places. So, again, this is places where it's combined, so that I'm pretty sure is a pipe because it's continued on. I wasn't able to do both of those at the same time, um, but still having.
bring them all the same math is helpful for figuring out. Um, this building burnt down in 1921, um, so, and this was kind of a parking area, so I could, it couldn't really, we, we tried to survey that, but it, it's, um, <laughs> there were a lot of things like cars and things that we could, couldn't really block off. Um, so that was kind of the closest that I could get, um, and it did, kind of record a linear feature, but this building moves around. Uh, it is in totally different locations depending on how I overlay the historic map and what buildings I attach in relation to where it is. Um, so it could be that, but it also it could be also another type or some other feature. Okay, um, so to finish up some of the other things that I've been finding, um, are kind of one thing people ask about when they ask about sanatoriums um, is kind of the issue of confinement um, and whether people were actually confined at sanatoriums. Um, it's very rare that people were actually like that was in the rules um, for the most part. In this one, you could leave for a certain number of days, um, but it would you would forfeit your stay. If you didn't, if you didn't come back on time, um, so there's nothing necessarily like in the records that that show um, that sort of thing. Um, I do know that like we, we do find like kind of more physical barriers around this site. Um, so in 1927, I think this like gate was built, and there's another gatehouse built, and there's kind of more fences that started going up. Um, I should note too, both of these have been removed. Um, I don't think, I think that one's also gone, the back chain link, although there are other parts. So there's kind of, the, the site is changing and the, where the, the boundaries, um, I think also probably the property um, areas. I think there were, there were tenants living on some part of the property at one point too. Um, so the uses change over time. Um, but that's one thing I'm tracking. Um, is looking at kind of the um, way that space gets segmented differently over time. Um, so I do think that kind of some themes that I've been, uh, some kind of preliminary themes that I've been thinking through um, are the ways that ideas of contagion um, and the use of space and different concepts of disease are changing. So originally, the way the sanatorium was built was very built around like certain foods and certain practices. Um, and there's kind of the idea of a sick rule where, um, and the sick rule is kind of this idea that um, people um, who are sick are, are socially, um, there's social pressure to think that all the like society should care for them, then there's a social pressure but for them to always be improving somehow or working on themselves. Um, so it kind of it changes in different ways. So that's one thing I've been looking through for the site um, is the way that that kind of changes. And then later on, there's like ideas of contagion come through. I think it's, I see more of what you can think of as like a sanatorium for a, a built a, a institution for contagious disease. There's a little bit more separation and segregation of the site. Um, and um, later on. So this is kind of reflecting sort of different ideas of where the disease is actually kind of coming from, whether it's something that a lot of like public health um, people in the early 1900s assumed that it was so common that everybody was kind of like, that most people were going to be exposed to it and that only certain people would develop it. Um, and then later on, it um, became, it, it kind of gets treated as more of like a, a contagious illness with a little bit more separation of space. Um, so that's kind of been what I've been seeing a little bit now. Um, yeah, and I'm still tracking some of that down. Um, and I think also I 
put this picture up there um, because this is, there's kind of these ideas of uh, something that gets recycled is this idea of like fighting the bug. Um, so this idea that people aren't are resisting against this like uh, the TB bacteria um, and this kind of it, a certain concept of the body as being resistant against this like. Um, the thing that's there, and before antibiotics, they really know how to get rid of it, so it's always going to be there. Um, but people are kind of resisting against it. Um, that kind of gets recycled in some of these, um, both in like the magazines by patients, but also in kind of the way that it's talked about medically and, um, and different different ideas about health in the building. So, um, obviously, I'm still working on this project. So, um, things that I'm doing is I'm trying to also research the Colfax sanatoriums to get um, a better sense of those um, in kind of the near landscape, um, but also trying to, I've been tracking through re the records, um, looking at sanatoriums all over the state. Um, at this point, too, so looking at it, trying to look at the way that they're advertised um, and compare this one to others. Um, I've also been looking, trying to understand um, kind of the way that these uh, that sanatorium places get reused um, and how um, ideas about health in the past compare or overlay um, to contemporary ideas about health. Um, and how this kind of also reflect, reflects the, the kind of global TB crisis, um, or the, uh, the global TB epidemic at this point. Um, yeah, and then there's also other situations, so I'm also, other threads that I am following up to as well, as far as how this relates to other um, instances of at other institutions. So, for instance, um, I know that um, during the 1940s, um, during Japanese internment, people at the sanatorium were moved to um, internment camps and then moved back. Um, and so, trying to think about some of like the diverse population and how that and how um, the health system kind of intersects with other things that are going on at that time too. And yeah, I'd like to yeah, thank everybody who's on who's helped on the project. about sunlight, yeah. um, so I don't yet know about the 
food. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something I've been looking into. To just comment quickly to Jen, I was looking for things on Lydia Child yesterday on, on JSTOR and noticed an article that was looking at changing ideas about kitchen arrangement through time. So I'll see if I can find that to yeah, pass on to both of you. Okay. That, would be, that would be handy. Um, I think the there's the interesting image of the, the bug. And the bug looks like it's sort of a hybrid paper, paper cockroach. Right? It's got a cockroachian beetle type, but more cockroachian. And it's worth thinking about you know, that that representation of it as a vermin, right? This sort of vermin that needs to be defeated really naturalizes that that moralistic notion of you've done something to get yourself sick and now you need to you need to reform yourself to to get better. Um, have you encountered anything talking about the role of urban pollution in in the cure and the fact that you know you take people out of polluted urban areas and up into the the mountains and suddenly they're they're able to fight the disease better. And you have this um, return, constant return of patients back to back to TV center so they, they get meat again. And you know, going up for the cure is always I just wonder because it seems like there's also some sustainability issues too in terms of contemporary discourse and, and the role of, of ignoring environment and public health issues. Um, yeah, so I've, I've seen there, this it kind of coinciding with like the whole pressure. I mean, in general, so there's kind of more general things I haven't seen. A lot of the ones that talk about like environments are a little bit more like talking about living spaces and urban, um, but, but there's definitely a lot of like kind of unsaid. So they're not necessarily using the word pollution. Is the idea that you know, urban spaces in general um, are are it, it, it are kind of causing the disease or making it worse? Um, they tend to talk a little bit more because I think some of the public health literature at that point was like that, or a lot of the like ideas about disease and the way that this, this track gets, gets, they talk about color a lot. Um, so I can get their, or at least a lot of their writing, um, focuses on the proximity of buildings to each other rather than the pollution. Um, but I definitely think as far as the public health discourse, it was, it was talked about. Um, in one case I can think of with the Arequipa Sanatorium, um, where it, that one was shortly after the 1906 earthquake. Um, so there's an idea that the earthquake um, and fires and everything were aggravating lung health. Um, so in some cases, they were connected that way. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was curious about your reference to Jerry that things are not under observation, or might be under observation at all times, but you drove from in the same area. Apparently that was a big deficiency in the same person. Um, I mean, I think that's
treat them more be a good place. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, I also was curious about your blueprint and the architecture. And um, so I have two parts to my question. The first is, <clears throat> can you say a little bit about where you got that blueprint? And also, uh, with your problems of missing buildings or not sure where they are, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the kind of half on material. Uh, it, do, do you have enough evidence to know who was contracted to build the various buildings at various times at the airport that these building companies, these contractors in the general coal bags or Sacramento area, do they themselves have blueprints? And do they, is there, you know, are you going to try and put a kind of a history of construction of the place? Are you going to be able to get that kind of data to sort of put this as well as your missing buildings in some kind of context to see kind of evolution with the, the historical changes that you're talking about? So I just don't know because this was your little case that all you gave us. Um, yeah, so this blueprint um, and most of the blueprints for the buildings um, were are saved by the Obi-Wan Institute, the people who are the current property owners. Um, so they go out and look them. Um, so a lot of them are there. Some of them are in the county archives. Um, and I'm fortunate in that there's most buildings on the site are very well documented up that way, at least as far as like what the intentions were for building. Um, and I've been trying to track down um, some of the architects um, that built these spaces. Um, so I'll be definitely be doing that. Um, there are, I think, well, well over 100 maps. Um, so as far as digitizing these um, it can be kind of an issue for me. Sort of kind of overlaying on yeah. this, and exteriorating and kind of seeing it grow and change and stuff. Yes. Yeah. So I'll go back to that room. Mm -hmm. And feng shui and also panopticon, I mean, as it moved, as it grew and it shrunk and it shifted, the access movement routes, visual or not, you know, air, you know, just all the things that you've been talking about will be theoretically able to be seen if you have that sequence. I mean, just terrific. Yeah, so um, I have been digitizing the overlay now. I don't have a slide up showing that. This is an example of one of the earlier ones that I digitized, so I traced over the lines. Um, a lot of the issues, do, so it's, the maps are like this big. Um, and I don't have a good way of scanning them right now, so, um, because they're, they have to stay in the and they can't scan those. Um, so, and I guess I've been looking at the same, if they're so big, that I have a portable scanner, or you can get like a portable scanner or something. Um, <laughs> that's not a good idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's definitely something I'm working on. These are actually like photos that I took and stitched together, mm -hmm. um, which is not the like most accurate way. Um, but I think also some of the maps too. Um, I guess because I think some of them they just trace over the buildings and then add new ones. Um, according to any changes, that they just get like a little different each time. Um, so there's like differences within the actual map. Um, the maps that I was showing, and it's hard for me to go through the slides, um, but the, so part of the mapping that I've been doing um, with the total station is to help with that. And the ones that I showed the geophysical survey, all of the lines for that, and all of the points for demonstration. Um, so hopefully that will help um, go on your process. So that will all go in on the TIS file, right? Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> it's multiple files. <laughs>
mingling and was there any pinky going on? I mean, what's the, what's the situation here? Because I think there's a whole social dimension that's fascinating. And you're kind of out in a different land where you can probably see maybe some alcohol or some other things like that that uh, might pick up on what's going on. Did they, did they lock them up at night or anything like that? <laughs> what was going on? Uh, so I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> I do know they have like recreational spaces which are shared. Uh -huh. um, so that's reason I was showing the social hall, um, and that's one reason I was trying to survey over that, was to find some of the shared spaces. Um, I don't know as far as, it, it does seem to be like kind of spatially uh -huh. separated out, um, and um, so I'm not really sure. I know at different sanatoriums, um, there have been like, um, there, there's one sanatorium in Fort Bayard, there, which used to be a TV sanatorium, but a nurse's building is like way away and like on a hill. Um, so sometimes in the, um, there's like separation in that way. Um, but I'm not, I, that's one thing that I had to yeah. that I'm going to know more. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Oh, and yeah, well, I should mention too, as far as Hayward's mood, there, there's a lot of like social spaces, but there were a lot of people who were in the bed too. Um, so there's a lot of people Even when I talked to the dining hall, there's a lot of people who were not allowed to go to the dining hall because they're so different. Well, thank you very much.